Ladies, summer is here. Now, if you have health goals this summer, you do not want to get sidetracked by sugar cravings or emotional eating. And so today we're going to talk about some strategies to help you overcome those if they come up for you while you're reaching your health goals this summer. Hey there, welcome to this episode. I am so excited that you're here to hang out with me today. We are kicking off summer. It's here, (laughs) like it or not. We are at the cusp of summer and summer is so awesome. It brings about so many great things, but it can also be, you know, a time of conflicting goals. And what I mean by that is when I think about summer, I think about some of my favorite foods. I think about barbecues. I think about picnics. I think about camping and having s'mores and going out for ice cream with my kids. These do not align with my health goals, but we definitely want to enjoy these treats. Now, when I also think about things about my career or other areas of my life, there are times that things get stressful. And when stressful things happen, sometimes I turn towards food. And I know I'm not alone in that. And so today we are going to be diving into some practical strategies that we can use to intervene to allow ourselves some freedom and some grace this summer without it compromising our goals, and what to do when emotional eating or sugar cravings start to come up so that we can still be true to our health goals. Now, because it is summer and we are talking about goals and intentions, if you are a Life Balance member, I hope that you have grabbed your Summer of Awesome planning kit available inside the membership on the website. You go to planning tools. It will be all right there for you. And if you're not yet a member, but you want to get your hands on this Summer Planning Toolkit, now is a great time to join. You can just go to lifebalancemembership.com or go to yourliferocks.com and click on the tab to join the membership. Now for today's conversation about sugar and emotional eating, I am joined by certified holistic health and life coach, Melissa Roloffs. Now this conversation is something that is purely taken out of a lot of her experience as a coach, but also her experience as a human being and her own history with food. But Melissa is going to share with us some really strong, great strategies that we can all apply when these things pop up to keep ourselves under control. Now, you can learn more about Melissa on her website by going to freetobecoaching.com. So without further ado, let's get into my conversation with Melissa. Melissa, welcome to the show. I am so excited to be talking about sugar and emotional eating because it is the time of summer. (laughs) And I feel like this is such an important topic to be talking about right where we are right now. But before we get into all of the great tips that you have for us today, share with our audience a little bit more about who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for having me, Jenny. I'm really excited to be here. And like you said, covering this topic, especially as we're getting ready for summer, but I'm Melissa Rolfs. I am a Christian. I'm a wife. I'm a mom. I've got a 13-year-old daughter, an almost 11-year-old son, and I'm a holistic health and life coach. And I got into that, Jenny, because of my own journey, my own story. About 10 years ago, we had a newborn baby. He wasn't sleeping. And our daughter had some sensory challenges and some undiagnosed food intolerances. And my husband was traveling for work. I was a burnt out, overwhelmed, exhausted frustrated mama who had just gotten a PTSD diagnosis due to childhood trauma. So with all of those things happening in such like a short amount of time, I really knew that that was God's way of saying, you know, Melissa, you need to make some changes, not only for yourself, but for your family. And so through prayer and just doing some internal work and healing, I really was able to change my relationship with sugar, my relationship with food, my relationship with myself, and as a result, my relationship with my family. So that's why I I do this because I know the impact that food has on mood and overall health. It's so true. It's one of those things that, you know, sometimes we just think about health as like lack of disease or some of us look at it as like weight loss or working out or or whatever but it really is like at the core what's responsible for the way that we function at work and how successful we can be and how level headed we can be with our kids uh how we sleep like all of those things our energy all comes from nutrition and I'm I'm learning that more and more especially through the many brilliant guests we have on this podcast like yourself And I think that it's such a valuable thing to always be talking about because the more we talk about it, the more aware we can be of those impacts. 
100%. And I think too, like we can't negate that this is stewardship, right? Like this is self-stewardship. And I think the word is very clear that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit and he's a holistic God and he cares about every part of our health and our being and who we are. And so I think for us as believers to not give this a little bit of thought and action is kind of doing him a disservice. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that I'm finding more and more, you mentioned, you know, your kids in their ages, mine are, are 12 and 16. I'm learning more and more that the way that I view nutrition and the benefits I'm trying to get out of nutrition and being able to teach my kids that, that it's not just about, oh, well, you know, you want to eat lots of vegetables or you want to, you know, make sure that you're getting good protein in, but really being able to explain to them why those things are important is such a gift to be able to set them on the right foot as they're going out into the world and doing life, which, you know, my mom didn't do any of that. It was just like, oh, you're sad. Here's some food. Oh, you're excited. And we're celebrating something. Have a cupcake. Like, you know what I mean? Like food was more about your feelings versus your, your overall well being. And I didn't learn that until way much later in life. And so I want something totally different for my kids. And I am so in the same situation with you. And that's what I think is really unique, Jenny, is that we can help our kids do that. Like we can explain to them, you know, our daughter just played basketball. And we're like, you know what? If you have foods that are going to nourish you and give you energy, you're going to perform better on the basketball court. So it's not even connecting food with size, but more about their interest and what they, they like and helping them see how that fits into them reaching their goals and really being who God made them to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's the cool thing too, is when you can show your kids, like, these are the foods that will help you do what you want to do in life. And, and then show them that like God created things, our food in a way to be able to provide that nutrition for us so that we can have these outcomes. It really does become this whole holistic picture of God's great creation and how it can relate to, to us and the way that we function in this life. 100% because I think if you are sick and tired, you can't live out the call of God on your life. You just can't. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now a dose of reality, (laughs) Miss Melissa, because this is, this is what my, the trap that I always fall in when it comes to health. I'm like, yeah. And I know this stuff and I love listening to audiobooks that are about health and nutrition and learning all of these things. And then I, you know, get stressed out and I wander out to the kitchen and I try to look for something that's like a cookie or ice cream. But if I can't find it, I know I have the ingredients to make it or I can order it easily with an app on my phone. So talk to us a little bit about why you feel like sugar in particular or emotional eating has such a grip on us that keeps us from like the common sense stuff that we know to do. Well, here's the thing. Like, I think we have a lot of information out there, Jenny. I don't think we suffer from not having enough information because as you said, we know what to do. I think it's we get caught up on the how, right? And so we really, I think, need to retrain our brains and how to do things. And we need to create new habits. And thank goodness for neuroplasticity because God has designed our brains in such a way that they can change. And so just because you did something one way before doesn't mean that's how you always are going to do things. You can change. So I think with that, you know, if you do find yourself in that place of in the kitchen, wanting the sugar, wanting the ice cream, whatever that is, one thing that's really helpful in that moment is to pause and say, what am I looking for right now? Because if you can identify why you're going for that, that's really insightful. Because for me, I used to use sugar to stuff my feelings down. I didn't want to deal with how I felt. So that was kind of my go-to. And it might be different for you know your listeners. But if you can just identify what you're looking for in the moment, that's really powerful. Because a lot of times, we're not even looking for food or nourishment, but we're looking for something else. And we're turning to food to fill that void. And that's never going to satisfy. I love that you say, what are you looking for? Because I've heard people give the advice before of when it comes to emotional eating in particular, you know, really get in touch with that feeling and what it means. And I try to do that, but but it's so much easier said than done. But I like the idea as far as what are you looking for? Like, because I think it rephrases it into more of a, of a different way that's a little bit more actionable. And I think that that's where sometimes like getting in touch with your feelings is hard for me, just my own personality to do, because it's it's not 
an action, right? Like I'm a, I want to know like, what do I do? What's moving yes. forward? And I feel like sometimes I, well, I know for a fact, I struggle with the be still and to focus, but I like the mm-hmm. idea of asking myself, what is it? What did you say? What is it that I need? What, what am, am I looking, looking for? for? Yeah. Yeah, because cravings are messengers. Like, I think if we can reframe that whole idea of a craving being bad or naughty and judging it, but if we can replace the judgment with curiosity, a craving is a messenger trying to tell us something. We just have to to step back and ask what it is. <laughs> That's so good. Now, so we're talking about like cravings and emotional eating, but because it is summertime, one of the things that we talked about right before we started recording you know, was that summertime is the time of year where we we want to maybe slim down a little bit. We want to have the energy that after work we can go on a walk with our kids or a bike ride or go swimming. Like we, there's everything that I think about for summertime is like active. Mm-hmm. And so I want to have energy to do those things with my kids and to make memories. But usually I'm exhausted. So <laughs> trying to find more energy to do those things is is difficult. And when I also think about summer, I think about s'mores. I think about ice cream. I think about you know, things that are not necessarily going to contribute to those overall goals. And so I think it is so timely to have you sharing the tips that you have today on how we can combat those things. Because if it's the wintertime, I would just tell myself, well, don't buy those things and don't have them in the house. But I still want them to be like part of my kids summer and be part of even my summer. Like I don't want a summer without s'mores. So I, you know, yeah, that does not sound fun. Um, So I do think it's important that we do look at this from a very balanced perspective. And and I do feel like it's really timely for you to be sharing these tips with us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if you like s'mores, have the s'mores. I mean, I don't want us to have this shame or guilt or condemnation around food because I think we probably do that enough in other areas of our life that we don't need to bring that into the food realm as well. Yes. (laughs) Um, So again, I think if we can replace that judgment with curiosity and you know, the other thing, Jenny, I love is that there is always like a healthified version of whatever it is that we love. So for your s'mores, you know, maybe there are some simple swaps that you could integrate instead of the marshmallows that have food dye in them, get some marshmallows that don't have dye in them. Like just make those simple tweaks where you're still having the food that you enjoy, but maybe you're getting some health benefit as well. Mm, That's really good. I like that. Now, one of the things that you talk about when it comes to sugar cravings, emotional eating is to stay hydrated. And I feel like going into summer, it's a little bit easier to drink water than maybe in the wintertime. But what is the correlation between being hydrated and sugar cravings? Yeah. So a lot of times we think that we are hungry and we're actually thirsty. So one thing I love to encourage people to do, especially if they're that that sweet tooth person like I was is to drink some water and let it, you know, just let it sit for five minutes and see if the craving maybe subsides. That's a really good way to kind of test if your body is dehydrated or if it is actually hungry for the sweet. And then I hear people say, well, I don't like water. It's really boring. And I think there are some really fun things you can do to spice up your water and give it some sweetness. You can add fruits. If you want a spa-like experience, you could add cucumber or mint. There are so many ways you can infuse your water to give it a little more pizzazz. Some people love that LaCroix bubbly water. Like there are so many ways that you can stay hydrated without being bored. (laughs) Yes, I love that. And so it might be a good excuse to spoil yourself for the summer and buy one of those like pitchers of water. I say this because it's on my my summer shopping list (laughs) is to get one of those pitchers that said, it sits in the fridge, but has like that infusion tube yes. through it where you can put strawberries or cucumbers or lemons or whatever you want to flavor your water with. Yes, 100%. I love that idea. Obviously, it's on my list. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it is a good way to kind of maybe change things up a little bit. Now, the question I have about like the bubbly or the LaCroix, the sparkling waters, I've heard some people say to avoid those for different reasons, it might upset your stomach or it doesn't have the same hydrating effects. What are your thoughts around that? I feel like if you are doing it not habitually, like the default, I think, is filtered water. That's probably the most pure form and probably the best for your body. But if you do feel like you want a treat and you're going to grab a candy bar or grab the bubbly water, grab the bubbly water because that kind of satisfies that feeling of having a treat and having like a pick-me-up. So I would say, you know, on occasion, I wouldn't say to drink it all day, every day, but if you did, whatever your body could tolerate is really the best thing because you're your own best health expert. You know, your body best just depends how it sits with you. But I would think if you're doing it in moderation, it would be okay. 
Okay. That's good to know because I love bubbly water, especially Mm -hmm. peach and apple. Those are my two favorite flavors. And I was using it as like a once a day treat Yeah, Yeah. whenever I like was craving something sweet. And then when I heard someone say that it's actually not a very healthy option, I was like, wait a minute, (laughs) but I like it. Yes. And you know, I think that's a really great example, Jenny, of a healthified swap because you could be having a pop or soda, however you say it in your region of the country, and the water is going to be a better choice. Yes. Yes. Especially in the summertime, because I really love like lemonades and strawberry lemonades and green tea, like iced green tea that are like sweetened, you know, with passion fruit or, or whatever it might be. I love those things, but I also recognize the fact that they are laden with sugar. And whenever I start to have a little bit of sugar, I want more sugar. Yes, because it's nine times more addictive than cocaine. So no surprise there, my friend. (laughs) Wow. It's amazing Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. effects that that can have on us. So how much sugar do you think is, because you like you mentioned before, like, you know, if you're craving something or you really want to have s'mores, just find a healthier way. But with that said of, you know, when you have a little bit of sugar, you sometimes will crave more sugar because it is addictive. Do you feel like it's our goal should be to try to eliminate sugar or how much sugar is a good amount of sugar? Or yeah, I don't like to of play sugar. the elimination game because then I feel like we set ourselves up for falling into the trap of, oh my goodness, I can't have it. And then we want it all the more, right? So I feel like it's almost better to know what is best for you and your body. Because again, we're all so different. God made us all so unique and really learning what your body is saying to you and what works best for you and your unique body type is the best route but I don't, I don't encourage no sugar at all because first of all, I don't really think that's realistic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then it, I think we can fall into feeling deprived and then we want it all the more. I just, I don't think it's realistic or sustainable. Okay. So it's, is it more about just kind of knowing our bodies? Yes. Or, okay. 100% yes. Because we live in a world of one size fits all, but that that's not the case. Like what works for one doesn't work for all. And I feel like that, also kind of dishonors the Lord and the way that he made us because he made us unique and perfect. And Psalm 139 says he knit us together in our mother's womb. And so for us to try to fit into the cookie cutter mold of what everybody else is doing, I don't know. I don't think that's that's his plan for us. Did you know that summertime is a great time to be investing in your own personal growth? And one of the easiest ways that you can do that is through listening to audible books. I don't know about you, but I love reading a good book, but sometimes I just do not have the time. But with it being summertime, there might be longer car trips. Maybe you're getting outside and walking more or just relaxing in your backyard after a long day's work, enjoying that extra sunshine. Your personal growth can be just as easy as hitting play on a great audiobook. Some of the books that I have recently listened to that I highly recommend, Developing the Leader Within by John Maxwell, Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets by Andy Stanley, and Think, Learn, Succeed by Dr. Carolyn Leaf. These are just a few of the books that I highly recommend. I'm currently listening to Atomic Habits. I know it's taken me a long time to get around to this book, but I am so enjoying it. So what are you waiting for? You can get a free audiobook by going to yourliferocks.com forward slash audible. That's yourliferocks.com forward slash audible, and you'll get a free audiobook for you to start your summer learning and take a step forward in becoming a better you. Okay. So kind of what I'm hearing you say is like (laughs) when we have these urges, whether it be a sugar craving or emotional eating, because sometimes I will admit emotional eating doesn't have so much to do with sugar. I mean, maybe it does on a really small level, but I might be craving like chips or anything. Mm -hmm. Um, I know for me, my emotional eating really comes a lot out of procrastination when I'm supposed to be doing things that I don't necessarily want to do. That's when I tend to wander to the kitchen to grab a snack because then I fill in that time with something else to do. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But you know, what I'm kind of hearing you say is that it's really about putting some other steps in place of that behavior before you get to that place. Is that right? 100% yes. You nailed it. (laughs) So starting with the water. Mm -hmm. And then how much water would you recommend? Like say I'm having some emotional eating moments or I'm really craving some sugar. How much water do you recommend drinking? Like a whole bottle, guzzling it? Like I would say maybe a glass, maybe, you know, six to eight ounces. Okay. Sitting for five minutes and see how it goes. Because a lot of times if you are going to the sugar for emotional eating, A 
a lot of times if we can drink something and sit for five minutes, whatever we are feeling or whatever has come up, we can kind of identify and be like, oh, maybe I'm not really hungry. Maybe I was trying to not deal with this or I was avoiding this or I was stuffing this feeling down or I need to work through this. It kind of creates this new opportunity of something that that needs to maybe be handled. Yeah, that's good. So have the water, pause, mm-hmm. and then ask yourself some questions. Approach it with curiosity and on why, why do I want this? What is going on right now? What I keep forgetting the question that you said to ask yourself that I thought was so impactful. What am I looking for? What am I looking for? That's really good. I'm going to actually write this down so I can keep it on a post-it <laughs> note in my office. Now, so talk to me about some other tips on how we can live this out because I do think it is such an important pattern interrupt and I'm all about having some pattern interrupts when we're creating a new habit for ourselves or wanting to have a different outcome from what we've been doing. So what other tips do you have and how we can really apply some of these principles? I think the replacing judgment with curiosity is also really powerful. Because again, I think, you know, maybe we tend to beat ourselves up and we tend to say we've fallen off track or I've already done this. So I'm just going to go. It doesn't matter. And it's kind of that all or nothing thinking, I think, that maybe gets us into trouble, especially because the word says we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So I think really just identifying, again, what am I looking for? Being curious instead of judging ourselves, because we also are really good at beating ourselves up and saying things to ourselves that we probably wouldn't say to anybody else. So true. So true. So what do you recommend when we're when we're doing that and we're maybe saying those things to ourselves? How do we break ourselves of that habit? I think becoming aware of it is the first step. The other thing I really like to do, Jenny, is to, and this is great for kids too, is to maybe write down some of the lies that, that we believe about ourselves. So get out a piece of paper, hold it in half, And on one side of the page, write down lies that I believe or things that I say to myself. And then get into the word and find scripture that counteracts that. Because the only thing that really counteracts the lie is the truth. So if you feel like, you know, I'm trying to think of something. What about like a one of those lies of I'm always out of control? Like, because that's kind of one of the things that I think of when I when I do start to do emotional eating. And then I look back and I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have eaten that. I have no self-control. Well, and I think what comes up just initially, and I'm I'm thinking this is the Lord and not me, I'm praying that's the case, is that we have the mind of Christ and greater is he living in us than he was in the world. So we do have the ability to control it. I think we just default to that habit of falling back into that. So I think if we can, again, replace that lie with the truth and kind of gauge what really feels out of control and what are we looking for, that could be really powerful. Mm, that's good. That's really good. So talk to me a little bit about the, because we started the conversation, both coming from that same background of of being raised where food, especially sugar, was used as a, a coping mechanism when we were, you know, things didn't go our way or as a celebratory thing when things did go our way. And so really a lot of those emotional patterns in our life have been construed around sugar. And so when we want something different for our kids, how do we balance that with like, tradition and kind of our own natural gut of how we respond with what we want to be different with our kids? Yeah, that's a great question because I do feel like, you know, in our society, especially we're inundated with sugar. If you think about it, they throw candy at parades. Like it's just all abundantly. It's in ketchup. It's hidden in so many places as well. And so I think, you know, having the understanding of the impact of sugar is really powerful. Because it's not, again, just about weight. It's about overall health and it impacts your mind and it impacts your emotions and it impacts your immune system. And there are so many components to what sugar does. And I think if we just have that understanding of what it does, that can be a really powerful reason to change. And then I think depending on the ages of your kids, you know, maybe just explaining to them why it matters and why it's important. And if your children, hello, I can talk, um, (laughs) are younger. I think it's almost easier because they don't know. But then when they get older, they'll, they'll be, you know, exposed to it at birthday parties and school and church and all the things. So I think, again, having that baseline of understanding why it matters and then finding some, maybe this is what we've done and it's worked pretty well, is having some favorite recipes that we just make some swaps with the ingredients. So 
instead of using the white sugar, we'll use coconut sugar because it helps to balance the blood sugar a little bit more. And I'll reduce the amount of sugar in recipes too. We have a dairy issue. So a lot of times we'll use dairy-free chocolate instead of regular chocolate, but just finding those swaps that you can make so that you're still having the same, you know, traditional recipe or food, if that's important to you, but just maybe mixing it up a little bit. So it's a little bit healthier. Oh, that's really good. Cause that was gonna be the next question I had for you is that you hear about so many healthy swaps that you can make. And I always wonder, like, so for example, if I am craving cookies, Mm -hmm. like I know a lot of recipes that I can do to make them healthier that don't don't involve white sugar or white flour or, um, you know, paleo cookies. Like there's, I've got a whole bunch of those types of recipes, but then I often wonder, am I still giving into a not so great habit by making a healthier version of that cookie when I just want to eat some cookie dough because I've had a a rough week or, or whatever it is? I think it depends on why you're eating the cookie, right? Like, are you eating it because you have had a rough week and you're kind of using that to decompress? Or are you just like, I want a cookie because it sounds good and I'm we're going to have cookies tonight. I think the why behind it is oftentimes can be really the indicator for us. Mm, okay. Okay. So it really does take a lot of introspection (laughs) to figure out what it is that we need to do around some of these habits that we have around sugar and emotional eating. Absolutely. And I think that can be really hard because like you, I'm very much type A, I'm on the go. And so I almost feel like it's really helpful to have somebody journey with you and pull those questions out of you because I'm just not going to sit down and figure this out by myself. Let's be honest. That's hard. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. (laughs) So what's the best way of finding that kind of help to be able to do that? Because like you said, we are busy. And so sometimes it's, you know, like I will deal with this later. Right now, I just want to have the candy or the whatever it is. And so how do we go through that process? Well, that's why I coach because that's exactly what coaching is. It's journeying with people, Jenny, and asking them the questions to figure out what's inside of them. Because again, you're your own best expert. You know your body. You know, you know, your situation way better than I do. I think we've, a lot of times people have fallen into the trap of, oh, well, I'm going to do a food plan. I'm going to do an exercise regimen. And I feel like that's more of behavior modification because you could do that for a little while. But if you're not really changing your habit and your mindset around food or sugar or whatever that is, that's not going to produce lasting change. And I think that's why we see the cycle that we do in the weight loss industry. Right, right. So having that approach that's really going to go on a deeper level than just kind of those base level retraining yourself to do something new. Or if you've gone through that process of trying to retrain yourself and not finding the success, and that's the best time to bring someone along to help you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because if you really want to change, you do need to change your mindset, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think that's hard to figure out by yourself. I struggled with it for a very, very long time. And I was frustrated a lot because I didn't know how to do it. I knew what to do. I knew what the word said, but I didn't, I was missing that gap of how to do this. (laughs) Right, right. Absolutely. So kind of going back to, to staying the hydrated, being slow, replacing judgment with curiosity, asking yourself, what am I looking for questions and spending time in that? I think it is important to kind of set up that structural piece around. We talk a lot about you know, creating a structure of success to help you whenever you're doing something new because the old patterns can definitely take hold and take over. So I think for everyone out there listening, if this is a struggle of yours to really think about what that pattern interrupt can be and how you can support yourself on a structural level with this. But then two, kind of going back to that, allowing yourself that grace to be able to have those s'mores with your kids and and maybe even decide in advance what you feel like your limit is, how much you feel like you can to do. Because for some people, it might be like, well, I'm just going to have one s'more. I know for myself, if I tell myself you're only going to have one s'more, I'm going to be wanting five s'mores. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I know that well enough about myself. And so maybe it is kind of really being able to challenge yourself on some of those ideas that you have on what it is that you want, why you want it, and giving yourself more of that permission than the restriction. 100% because Jenny, I was very much that way. And that's why I would be, you know, 10 years ago, that overwhelmed mom in the pantry eating the whole thing of Oreos because I was just going to have two. And then the two turned into the whole package. And so I think to your point of having systems, it's really important to understand why you're doing something and have a really deep, powerful why 
And then connect your why to things in your environment that can serve as anchors. And so when you see those things, they can be that pattern interrupt for you and they remind you of why you're doing it. So some people use their screensaver on their phone. Some people use the screensaver on their computer. Some people use a verse, whatever that is for you to just kind of serve as that record scratch almost of, wait, this isn't in alignment with my why. I need to get back to why I'm doing this and find something that is in agreement with that goal. Mm, That's so good. All right, perfect. So the last question I have for you, Melissa, is really geared more to that emotional eating piece and really looking at that that could be different for everybody. For a lot of people, it is sugar. For a lot of other people, it could be alcohol. It could be chips. It could be comfort food like macaroni and cheese or sandwiches or or all kinds of different things. Or it could be whatever is closest to you when those emotions come up and we want to kind of fill those emotions with food. What advice do you have for people who are kind of going through that and have that food emotion connection and wanting to make that change, but really, really struggling? What last piece of advice do you have for them to maybe encourage them to try again? It could also be shopping. I don't know why, but that kept coming up too, because I think it's emotional and I think we want something to kind of numb that pain. Mm -hmm. Um, So whether it is, like you said, Jenny, you know, sugar or chips or alcohol or shopping or whatever. I just want people to know that there is hope that you absolutely can change. You can find freedom from this. I know that that God did it for me and he can do it for other people as well. And he has. And one thing I think that might be really kind of powerful and hopefully encouraging on the last note here is I worked with a woman who found herself craving cheese and crackers and she didn't like cheese and crackers. And so we did a little digging and we asked some questions and it turns out that she was associating the cheese and crackers with a really happy time in her childhood when family was together, friends were there, and she was just having a lot of peace and harmony and happiness in her life when she was eating the cheese and crackers. And so she found herself eating cheese and crackers as an adult when she wasn't having those feelings. And so we were able to kind of figure out the connection of wanting this because you're looking for this. And cheese and crackers isn't the answer. So we found things for her to fill that void with. So I think just slowing down, replacing judgment with curiosity and asking, what am I looking for? Can really be game changers. And if you like to journal or if you like to make videos or if you like to record audios to kind of have a record, that could be really helpful too, because you can change. You absolutely can and anything is possible. I like that. I like that. I'm adding to my post-it note right now. (laughs) After ask what I am looking for, how else can I get it? Because a lot of times we don't, we maybe know what we're looking for or we know what the void is, but we don't have something else to fill it with. So if we can find something else to fill that void with that is in alignment with our goals, that could be powerful as well. Maybe make a nourishment menu for yourself of things you can pull from instead of going towards food. Mm, That's powerful. That's good word to end on, Miss Melissa. I love it. Well, if people want to get in contact with you, if they feel like they may need some help moving through this and, and having someone to help identify and make those connections for them, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. My website is free, the number two, the letter B, coaching.com. So free to be coaching.com because my heart is really for women to be free to be who God made them to be. I love it. That's great. And we will link to that in the show notes page. And I just pray that God would continue to use you to be speaking into women's lives and and to give them that courage to be able to step out and be who God created them to be. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Jenny, for having me. And thank you for the work that you're doing in the world and you just being his voice, because I think we need that. We need that dose of inspiration and encouragement in our pocket. So thank you for what you're doing on your podcast. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Hey, just because the episode's over doesn't mean we have to stop hanging out. Head on over to Instagram and follow me there. You can find me at your.life.rocks. Or if you're more of a Facebook kind of girl, join our community of working Christian moms just like you. You can search Your Life Rocks over on Facebook and connect with us there. And if you're ready to truly create lasting balance and get results in your life, maybe it's time for you to join Life Balance Membership. Download the Your Life Rocks app in iTunes or in Google Play. You can upgrade to the membership right inside the app. And if you're looking for more resources to help you create more balance, head on over to yourliferocks.com.